The New Year's Eve Seam by R.J. Ehlert. Connie Lambert willed her hands from her ears and opened her eyes. This was supposed to be. No, she told herself this would be the last step of her immersion therapy. With back pressed against a wall across the street from the one Times Square building, Connie sucked down her third shot of whiskey from a travel flask. At least the drinks helped with the cheering masses. Agoraphobia, the fear of open spaces and crowds, was no condition for a modern New York woman. And that's what Connie was, she reminded herself. Rita, Connie's therapist, helped her deal with the anxiety which had only grown worse since her adolescence. Now, Connie was finally achieving her ambitions in the publishing industry, albeit as a junior agent. When Connie was a teenager, she thought the job meant she could just read for a living, perhaps discover the next Nicholas Sparks sitting in a cramped basement office, still using a mechanical typewriter. Unfortunately, the reality of this profession required frequent travel to writing conferences and other locales of the business. The exact kinds of situations that triggered the feeling of a million pins pressing out from her insides. Rita had been a godsend. Improbable serendipity had put the psychiatrist at the first convention Connie had attended after being hired by the Richard Reed Literary Agency. The two quite literally bumped into each other, and when asked if she was okay, Connie broke from her modus operandi by explaining how nervous the situation made her. Rita handed over her card, and the rest was a storybook success tale. The final step Rita had prescribed for Connie was to attend the ball drop in Times Square and welcome in the new year as a person freed from the chains of irrational fears. So here she was, in possibly the most triggering situation for her condition, but she was doing all right. Mostly all right. Connie took a fourth swallow from her travel flask. The screams from the crowd spiked in intensity. All the secret pins inside her threatened to push their way to the surface. Rita's words came back to her. Take the safety of home with you. You're just as safe in a crowd as you are at home. Connie noticed the reason for the crowd's increased excitement. The Times Square ball lit up its kaleidoscopic exterior with a brilliant blue that showed clearly above the city. Smaller flashes came from within the globe, and streaks of light danced across its surface as it transitioned to different colors. It was less than one minute before the calendar rolled into the next year. Connie looked into the mass of bodies that occupied her corner of the world. Everyone she could see looked up at the ball as it dropped. Everyone she could see was with someone, someone they could share this time with. It had been almost three years since Connie moved to New York City, and she had yet to make any relationship closer than work associates. Some had invited her to their New Year's parties, but she didn't want to impose. A sense of melancholy overtook her anxiety and dimmed the joy she fostered in the process of overcoming her fears. It was then, with just half a minute left for the globe to finish its descent, that Connie noticed a man not seven feet from her. He, too, had his back against the wall and alternated his gaze between the Times Square ball and the crowd which had massed around it. He wore a knee-length, coal-colored overcoat with a pinstripe shirt and silver tie beneath. His gloved hands were in his pockets. Medium-length hair swept back from his defined face, and he wore an expression of wistful longing. The most important quality Connie noticed about him was that he was distinctly alone. An unusual bubble of space separated him from the crowd, and she was the only one turned to face him. The prospect of another person coming out to see the ball drop, surrounded by this deafening mass of people, but alone in it, no one to share the experience with, was unacceptable. Before she knew it, Connie was in front of the stoic man, smiling up at him. Whether it was the therapy, the empathy, or the whiskey, which gave her courage. There she was, entering a social danger she had never been brave enough to face before. For a second, he didn't register that she looked up at him. Then, his pale eyes lowered to meet hers and an eyebrow arched. His lips twitched into a tentative smile and parted slightly. The crowd's roar coalesced into a unified chant. Six, five, four, three. Connie bit her lip for one second of hesitation but then pushed away her inhibition just as she pushed away the internal pins. She moved into the man's space, reaching her hands behind his neck. His hands moved, but they were restrained by the overcoat's pockets, and he said one word that Connie couldn't hear, but had a W shape. 
It was just a kiss, a tradition for the stroke of midnight, bringing good luck into the new year. Connie's lips met the man's just as the crowd finished their chant. Two, one. His lips were cold and tasted of iron. The overpowering noise of the crowd froze on a note which sounded like cloth tearing endlessly, doubling upon itself until it became a terrible roar. Connie opened her eyes and she was alone on the sidewalk, but that wasn't precisely true. Hints of color flashed by her and she had the notion they were people moving too fast to see. A strobe of lights flashed through Times Square and she looked up to see the sun streaking through the sky. Day became night became day became night until it moved so fast there was no difference. The blare of ripping fabric beat at her eardrums. Somehow, through the flashing madness, she was able to see the ball drop again. Another year had passed. Then the ball dropped again, and again, and again. How many times had it been? She looked at her hands, which looked dry, leathery, the skin loose. Her hair was longer and dull. The ball dropped and dropped and dropped. Finally, the blur of everything slowed and one last object dropped. This wasn't fixed atop any building, but came out of the clouds, propelled by fire, trailing black soot across the sky. The object hit New York, and in that still second, the strange man was next to Connie again. Then light, brilliant, terrible, powerful light scoured the city. The people filling the streets erupted like matchsticks only to become ash. In the next stretched second of time, the building shattered and flew away from the impact. The crowd shouted, Happy New Year! Connie fell away from the strange man and held her head. The pins from within her were back, worse than ever before, a billion sharp points of pain radiating out from within her body. She looked up at the people next to her, fireworks shot into the air, confetti rained down, and no one could distinguish her screams of terror from the jubilation of the crowd. White flames burned the flesh away from the people next to Connie. They were also perfectly intact and perfectly happy. She looked past them and found others who were not on fire. Some were crushed by steering wheels in their chests, with beads of car glass embedded in their skulls. Others gripped their chests in the throes of heart attacks, while some withered away as their life and body mass were taken over by cancerous tumors. But most, by far most, were burning to ash in that burst of nuclear destruction. But they were all happy and healthy and celebrating the first minute of the new year, not a single wound on them. It was like each of Connie's eyes told her something different about the people she saw, the images overlaid. Both were somehow true, just at, just at different times, she realized. How many times had the ball dropped? How many years had passed, would pass before this happened? The information slipped through her, like waking from a dream too hard to recall her experience in exact detail. Connie looked back at the strange man who had been with her at the beginning and the end of the terrible vision. In one sight, she saw the average, if handsome man who was also alone on New Year's Eve. In the other sight, she saw something that was difficult to comprehend. The being had the rough similarity to a human. At first, Connie assumed it wore an ancient suit of plate mail armor, but there was no distinction between where the skin ended and the metal began. The being's body was the armor. Metal became yielding gray flesh at the joints. It was covered in runes that looked more like branded skin than embossed steel. The head was the worst. Fine strands of metal thread comprised the same swept back medium length hair that the human image had. Almost all the features were the same, except a miniature blade stuck through the gray skin on his skull in a picket formation of alternating heights, pointed toward the sky. A crown from within, with rusty trails of blood leaking down the face, standing out all the more prominently for the dead steel flesh. The other quality of this monstrous image which varied from the human one were the eyes. They were simply hollow sockets. As Connie stared into the holes, she knew that they saw back into her. She also knew that this horrid image was not like the rest of the crowd. This vision had nothing to do with this man's death. Looking at the unearthly second image of this stranger, she was not sure this being was alive enough to ever experience death as a mortal can. 
the impassive face tilted down, and a noise that was both rusty hinge and liquid squish came from the being as it bent down toward her. Connie screamed again and tried to push herself along the ground away from its reach. A gray hand with daggers pushing through the fingertips, trailing their own streams of rusty blood, closed on her shoulder. As soon as the contact was made, there was just one image in front of her instead of two. It was just the man in the overcoat with the silver tie and pale eyes. Connie looked about frantically, but all the people had returned to their one sane, alive, present-day appearance. But somewhere in the back of her mind, she could still feel the death visions. They were just buried. The stranger's pale eyes flicked to the crowd and then back. He said, You are not meant to see through the seam between years. The effect should pass in time. He stood up and turned. Connie shouted, When does it happen? When does everyone die? The stranger gave her a sad smile and replied, Sooner than they would believe. He walked into the crowd and the people opened up space for him and then closed again, unaware of his passing.